Yes, we have. Uh, could you make sure everybody gets press kit there, Mark? Okay. Let me know when you gents are ready. Okay. Set? Okay. Good morning. My name is Richard Burke. I'm the executive director of the Libertarian Party, and I'm also the campaign chair for Richard Morley, our candidate for Secretary of State. In your press kit today, you'll find a copy of Richard's speech today, um, a copy of the press release we're putting out as soon as this conference is over, and a candidate biography of Richard Morley. Uh, we're holding this press conference today because the incumbent, Secretary of State Bill Bradley, has repeatedly put forth administrative rules and policies which have hurt our initiative process and hurt voters' access to the initiative process. We believe it is time for major reform of Oregon's process, and we have some ideas today that Richard will tell you about. So without further ado, I'll introduce Richard Morley, our candidate for Secretary of State. <coughs> Thank you, Richard. Good morning. I'm here today to tell you about a serious threat to the democratic process here in the state of Oregon. And then I will tell you what I plan to do to deal with that threat. Oregon state law provides that the Secretary of State, who is the chief elections officer for the state, may adopt rules in the administration of election law. ORS 247005 further states that, quote, it is the policy of this state that all election laws and procedures shall be established and construed to assist the elector in the exercise of the right of franchise. Now, it is my opinion that Secretary of State Bill Bradbury is in violation of this law. Using his administrative authority, Mr. Bradbury has repeatedly impeded the ability of voters to participate in Oregon's initiative petition process. Thousands of legitimate Oregon voters have been affected. These voters have signed initiative petition forms in good faith, being careful to abide by the rules as stated on the forms. They have signed these forms with the expectation that their voice will be added to others in favor of putting particular initiatives on the ballot for consideration by voters. Unknown to them and without their awareness, the perfectly good signatures of thousands of voters are systematically discarded by Bradbury's elections office, not because of anything the voters have done wrong, but because the person circulating the petition forms violated some arbitrary and unnecessary policy laid down by Bradbury regarding the circulator certification section of the petition sheet. Now, I would like to show you just two examples today of hundreds of petition forms rejected entirely by Bradbury's elections office. And I'll ask Mark Delphine and my staff here to hold these forms up for you. The first is one for a constitutional amendment to limit non-economic damages for patients injured by health care provider negligence or recklessness. Now, sheet number 72 of the petition was signed by 10 voters on 4-21-04. The person circulating the petition then signed and entered the date down here as 4-20-04. Well, then he appears to have caught his mistake and struck through the zero with a very firm one, which is apparently his attempt to correct his error. Bradbury's people threw this form out entirely, and 10 legitimate voters lost their right to franchise. They were not included in the count for this initiative petition. Now, I asked the head of the elections division what would have happened if the uh, circulator had put his initials next to this change so that any reasonable person could see that the person who initialed the change was the same person who signed the form. He said to me, it would have been thrown out anyway. 
And when I pointed out that in my career as an auditor, I had seen many legal document changes accepted with such initials by the signer, including banks who often accept checks, who will always accept checks that are initialed in such manner to change the amounts or other information. He said to me, we are not a bank. I ask you, how does this assist the voter in exercising his right to franchise? Now, the second sheet is number 5151 of a petition to put on the ballot a measure to require balancing timber production and manage state forests with conservation and preservation. Again, 10 voters in good faith signed this petition sheet. The person circulating the sheet signed and dated it as required. But his name, while spelled out in this printing here, his signature looks like the initials of his first and last name. Well, the Elections Division threw this whole sheet out. They didn't even bother to find out if maybe this is the way the man signs his name. They discarded the entire sheet. Ten more voters were disenfranchised. Their votes were not counted for this ballot initiative. I ask you again, how does this assist the voter in exercising his or her right to franchise? Now, this third page is a blank initiative petition signature form. Now, notice in the upper right-hand corner, it says that this is a statewide petition. But it goes on to require that the signers of this page be active registered voters in only one county in the state. If a voter from Lake County signs a sheet that's labeled for Washington County, for example, that voter's signature is disqualified. Well, not only that, but 19 other signatures are disqualified because that's probably found on a, on a sampling technique. So they'll throw out 20 signatures as a result of the wrong county voter signing on this form. On statewide ballot initiatives, any, quali any qualified Oregon voter anywhere in the state should be able to sign this petition form. This one county only requirement was created for the convenience of the elections division and county elections workers. But even that is not necessary with today's technology. I ask you again, how does this assist the voter in the exercise of their franchise? Now the lower part of this form is for the signature and the printed name, address, and the date signed of the circulator of the petition. What is the compelling reason for the state interest? What is the compelling state interest in including circulator information on this form? How does that assist the voter? It only helps the Secretary of State by providing a pretext to reject otherwise valid voter signatures. It's worth noting, by the way, that the state of Washington doesn't even have a circulator section on their initiative petition form, and they do just fine. And here in Oregon, selected samples of signatures are individually compared to those found on voter registration cards to determine validity. This being the case, as far as these signatures are concerned, who cares who circulated the form? Even if one could argue that the state has an interest in knowing who circulates in its initiative petition sheets, based <coughs> any policy that disqualifies valid signatures on these pages, signatures made in good faith, based on circulator error, does nothing to assist voters in the exercise of their franchise. Circulator errors should never, never disqualify otherwise valid voter signatures. The Secretary, thank you Mark, the Secretary of State's office will, as they have in the past, try to convince the press that all of this is done in the name of protecting us all from voter fraud. I've done a substantial amount of auditing for fraud over the years, and these examples go far beyond fraud protection. They clearly represent an effort to impede the right of Oregon's voters to petition their government. 
The issue of voter fraud is just a smokescreen that Bill Bradbury uses to justify administrative policies which undermine the initiative petition process. I propose changes to the petitioning process that I believe will stop this attempt by the Secretary of State to impede voters' rights. First, of course, is to elect Richard Morley as Secretary of State. Once elected, I will use the administrative rulemaking authority of my office and lobby the legislature as needed to reverse Bradbury's assault on Oregon's initiative petition process. This will include following the Washington model by eliminating the one county requirement and separating or eliminating the circulator certification from the petition form. Finally, I will ask the legislature to place on the 2006 ballot an amendment to the Oregon Constitution to change the initiative process. And if they will not do that, then I will support an initiative petition campaign to do so. Now the change I propose would involve using the primary election ballot as a means by which voters can add their names to individual petition efforts. To make the primaries list of proposed initiatives, each one would first have to have received some minimum number, perhaps 25% of the present requirement, of valid signatures on standard initiative petition signature sheets. Voters in the primary then would choose those on a list that they want to see voted on in the general election. These initiatives would receive, the, which receive enough signatures on the petitions plus votes of support in the primary would be presented to voters in November. This new initiative system will simplify and strengthen the voter validation process. Because ballots are currently signed by voters whose signatures are verified, there would be no question of signature validity. Errors by circulators would have no impact on the acceptance of otherwise valid voter signatures. The cost of petitioning government would be greatly reduced for both the state and the petitioners. Oregon voters whose signatures have been disqualified for specious reasons will regain their right to franchise. Now there are those who believe that the initiative petition system is bad for Oregon and that it undermines representative government. If I agreed with this position, which I don't, Oregon's Secretary of State still has the obligation to faithfully implement policies related to initiative petitions which assist the voters in the exercise of their franchise. The proposals I have outlined today demonstrate my willingness to do just that. Thank you. Are there any questions? These are related to the complaints by the, uh, by the people who brought that lawsuit in Portland. They are also complaining about this issue of circulator error and uh, and so it's related. I have had no contact with the people who are filing that lawsuit uh, directly, so I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, know exactly what their what their claim is. Uh, how concerned are you with, with circulator fraud? It was an issue several years ago. Circulator fraud is always an issue, and as an auditor, of course, I'm concerned about it. I think circulator fraud is something that has to be dealt with but not in a way that disenfranchises legitimate voters, and that's what the Secretary of State is doing now. The, the circulator error, we won't go so far as to call it fraud at this point, but the circulator error uh, should not be used as an excuse to disenfranchise voters. That's, that's just a, that's a bad, bad thing to do, and that's what the Secretary of State, Bill Bradbury, has been doing. In 1987, I became the first audit manager, state audit manager, for performance auditing in the state of Oregon government. That is correct. Yes. How, how long were you with the, uh, I was there uh, a little less than three years. 
two, just over two. Prior to that, I did the same work for the city of Portland for about three years and briefly for Multnomah County as well. And then I've been in private practice since then. Going to your proposed constitutional amendment, in which people could get on the ballot a proposed initiative with, as you said, perhaps 25% of the current requirement, and then um, people could select the ones they want to see in the fall. Right. Um, there have been some concerns in well, just a few years ago that a tremendous number of ballot, uh, measures on a ballot a lot for voters to absorb, and, and not that people are stupid, but they're busy, and there's a lot of campaigns to deal with, sure. and so on. Could that lead to um, perhaps an ungainly number of... It insurance? very well might. It very well might, um, because all of the people who vote in the primary will then be aware of measures which may come for a, for a vote in favor or against those measures in the November election. Um, that's an issue uh, to be dealt with. And perhaps the voters will decide after a little experience that too many measures are getting, getting through that process and they may want to raise the hurdle a little bit. They may want to require more votes. I don't know exactly at this point what the rules will be for acceptance of a measure for the November ballot, but, uh, but there's certainly some advantage to using the primary ballot with a list of those measures as a tool to choose those that will go on and be on the, uh, on the November ballot. But they should first qualify to get on the list, and then the list will be presented to voters, and the voters will choose those which they think should move on and be, be voted on by the entire uh, voting population in the, in the November ballot. Yeah, we could have more. We could see more. Uh, I don't think that's, you know, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's the people's choice, and the people should make a decision whether, whether the people should vote on these things or not. Should there be a, um, well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, people have a two-year time period now in which to qualify and measure for the ballot. You can start quite a ways ahead of time. Not that they don't necessarily all do that. Then if they don't make it for, say, this fall, they have to start over for the next two, uh, two years, another two years later. Should there be, a, I'll put it this way, some people think there shouldn't be that time limit, that if you don't make it for this November, you ought to be able to just keep those signatures and keep on going for uh, two more years later. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? No, not really. Um, I don't know that, that these proposals should, should be carried on ad infinitum or ad nauseum, whichever the case may be. Uh, Again, I think it's a people's decision, and I think that uh, if, if, if the rules uh, regarding this are too loose now, maybe they need to be tightened. If they're too tight, they need to be loosened. But that's something we can, can address when we address the ballot uh, or the measure to change the Constitution to use the primary ballot as a tool to, uh, to qualify initiatives for the November uh, ballot. I think we can, we can face that question at that time. I'm not here today to, to tell you if two years is too much or too little. It just came up in conversation the other day and I thought I'd mention it. Yeah. Are you, have you talked to Brad Gray's campaign or Betsy Close's about debate possibilities? About what? Debates. Uh, I haven't directly. Uh, Mr. Burke is the uh, chief of staff of my campaign. He can respond to that, if you would. Um, thank you very much. Um, I actually have uh, spoken with Betsy Close, not about the debate, but uh, suggesting that uh, we get together and talk about it, and uh, debates would be one of the issues that would come up. But I think this is less of an issue for us than it's ever been before. Uh, four years ago, in the Secretary of State's race, where we ran uh, Edwin Pohl, he was invited to the Portland City Club. He was in a variety of debates, and of course, Tom Cox's gubernatorial race in 98, we were in just about all the debates. I got in some debates when I ran for governor in 98. We're having less and less trouble getting into debates because people are finding that when we're included, the debates are more interesting. Uh, people tend to watch them, and the sponsors of debates like interesting events, and they like what we have had to contribute. And so we don't think that we would have problems getting to the debates this year particularly if they're sponsored 
by groups like the League of Women Voters who state it is their mission to advance voter education. So they'd be doing the voters a disservice and working against their own mission if we were not included. So at this point, we have full confidence that we'll be in the debates, and uh, we'll work very hard to see that that, that, that happens. Yeah. And by the way, we have already been invited by the League of Women Voters in Deschutes County to uh, attend a forum and in October, and we have accepted that invitation, and last I heard they were waiting for response from the other two candidates for Secretary of State, and I, I haven't heard whether they've responded or not. Any other questions? Thank you very much. It's nice to be here today.